Hello and welcome to Tea Time. I am Miss Andrea. And I'm Miss Mayor. And today we're going to talk about trends in homeschool. So traditionally, people have homeschooled for a variety of reasons, many of them ideological. Sometimes um, religious. Sometimes just for freedom of learning. I mean, if we're going to go back to the early days of modern homeschooling, um, we're going to go back to the 1980s when it was illegal to homeschool and people were out fighting to homeschool. And a lot of those people were homeschooling um, just to give their children freedom, to let them be children. And then we started seeing the religious component come in. And then we started seeing, you know, I want to decide who my children mix with at an early age. Well, and what they're learning. Right. I want to pick the curriculum that my children are exposed to because I disagree with one idea or another that mm -hmm. is being taught on a large scale. Um, when I jumped into homeschooling around 2003, for me, it was academic excellence. I was being told on one hand that my children had gifted tendencies, on the other hand, my children had some neurodivergence. And so the schools wanted to lean into the neurodivergence and I'm like, but the gifted. And I think no. that that kind of feeds into the, some of the things that we're seeing now in the current students that we work with and in some of the communities that we're a part of. Neurodivergency and properly supporting that is a major reason that some families are choosing to homeschool, that their needs are not being met in a traditional school system. Yeah. Um, in the homeschool services we provide, I want to say 85% of our kids exhibit some kind of neurodivergence, as do I as an adult. Right. So. But here's the mm -hmm. thing about students who are generally neurodivergent, and mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, a traditional schooling environment works for probably 70% of the population. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why so many people are successful in that environment. Um, it's fitting kind of right there in the middle of the road. And so it's the people who deviate to one side or the other that that doesn't necessarily work for. Um, but most individuals who are neurodivergent are also gifted because Everybody has a gift or a talent or a genius. It's just being able to find what that is and lean into it. And one of the drawbacks to a tr traditional schooling system, because everything is taught at grade level, if somebody's struggling in a certain area, for instance, they have a dyslexic issue, so their reading is not on par with their classmates, then not only are they going to be getting remedial help with that reading, but oftentimes things like math, science, art, whatever else it is that they're studying, they're going to have to do that at the same level as where they're reading. And that is so unfair. Right. Because if somebody's super gifted in an area, mm -hmm. then now they are not able to pursue that to their first fullest ability because they've got this one struggle that needs to be addressed. And so that's definitely a trend because parents are beginning to recognize that there's giftedness in all children. And I've been a strong proponent of that for 20 years. Every child has a gifting and it's up to the family, the parent, and any instructors to try and help pinpoint that so that we can lean into that giftedness and the neurodivergency just becomes something that we have to balance to keep that giftedness where it should be. Which is not to say that you shouldn't work on and remediate places that somebody's struggling. Right. Um, but at the same time, don't hold them back from things that they're extraordinarily mm -hmm. good at. So serving populations of students who have these neurodivergencies, I do think that that's a key shift mm -hmm. in the homeschooling landscape. However, I think it's a more complex issue than that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times these students, not only are their needs not necessarily being met in a traditional environment, largely because there aren't enough people who can provide services. A lot of that really requires one-on-one -on -one attention and traditional school systems aren't designed to provide one-on-one -on -one attention well. No. Um, 
but also from a social aspect, from an interacting with peers, especially once you get to middle school and even to some extent high school, when you have somebody who has some kind of a difference, that's also showing up in their social interactions, which can very often result in bullying, harassment, physical safety issues mm -hmm. for these students. So I, mm -hmm. I think a student's physical safety is another one of those issues that's causing a shift in the homeschool landscape. Well, absolutely, most of the kids that we're seeing who are coming into the homeschool realm for physical safety also have, tend to have a major neurodivergence. Right. Because neurodivergent kids get bullied. Right. And so there's that. So that's one major trend versus shift coming into homeschooling right now. Another major one, which I'm not a fan of, is the post-COVID surge. And it shows up in message boards with things like, I took my kid out of school, where do I take them to homeschool? And I'm like, it's not how any of this works. Um, yeah, wrong. Um, let's talk about this. Let's sit down and talk about this. And there, you know. we're still seeing some of this. So mm -hmm. immediately in the COVID schooling time frame, mm -hmm. where you had- and I love that word, COVID schooling, because that's exactly what was happening. Right. So mm -hmm. students were often being put in positions where they had to log in on a computer and they were still doing the same seat time that you would have in a classroom. And now they were doing it in front of a computer and that didn't translate well. Um, the cool so, thing is parents got to see what the children's frustration was. True. Yeah. That is true. Mm -hmm. So you had students who didn't thrive in that environment. So parents are like, well, I can't screw this up any worse than the traditional school system is. And so they pulled a bunch of kids from the school system and said, well, I'm going to homeschool. A lot of those families have actually started returning back to the, the traditional schooling yeah. that they were um, doing. Before. And that's having some different repercussions. Which is having its own set of repercussions. Yeah. What we are still seeing from that is students who either persisted with the traditional model despite the fact that it wasn't really working for their kids mm -hmm. um, or tried, you know, more or less, I guess, took the year off and then tried to pop back in. But now their students are behind where they should be in benchmarks. Yeah. And so parents are now saying, well, if I homeschool them, I can accelerate them and get them back to where they're supposed to be. And that doesn't work as well as people said it sounds great in your head looks good on paper um the reality of it is that that doesn't translate real well to the practical the reality world. is if you take a year off from work that kids don't like doing good luck getting to do it indeed like i'm seeing a lot of kids who have dug in their heels and said i'm not doing math anymore i feel better about myself when i don't do math so therefore i'm not doing it because you took a year off instead of taking two weeks off and then easing them back in. Um, can we fix that? Eventually. Um, but that's gonna be a hard climb. Um, the final shift in homeschooling that I'm aware of because I am part of that demographic and I am, I guess I would be a pioneer <laughs> in that demographic is black, Hispanic, Asian people streaming into homeschooling. When I started homeschooling, I was the only black person for miles. Um, and I'm not going to generalize because we're not a monolith, but for me, it was about academic excellence. I was being told your children are gifted. However, we don't want to treat them as gifted because we have these areas. And I'm like, man, mm -hmm. yeah. well, no, I'm not doing that. Some of the students mm -hmm. that we've worked with. Mm -hmm. And so this, I would call a trend, mm -hmm. um, again, it's not across the board, mm -hmm. but the student will go to a guidance counselor and say, this is my dream, whatever mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. And kids can have some big dreams. And the guidance counselor will be like, well, but I think this is what you should be doing. And but this is the dream. But, but this, this is, is what, what you should, should be doing. doing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times in immigrant communities, mm -hmm. a lot of times in communities of people of color, you might have a guidance counselor, for better or worse, saying, let's be realistic about your opportunities. And so we'll see parents that will absolutely pull their children and say, mm -hmm. but this is the dream. Mm -hmm. And we're going to figure out how to get this dream because you are not serving that purpose. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we actually worked with some students who were still in a traditional school system, mm -hmm. giving some advice, okay, you know, in an advisory capacity, mm -hmm. helping them try and figure out what's necessary I, I for their a, students to get to. I had a young lady come to me, young lady, her mother came to me, and they said, you know, ninth grade, and they came to me in eighth grade because they'd heard, you know, some work I've done with other kids. And they said, well, I went to my guidance counselor and said, I want to go to Columbia. And the guidance counselor said, well, I can get you into UGA. And that was the end of the conversation. Which is not a knock on the guidance counselor. Because mm -hmm. when you, we're in Gwinnett County, Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's the largest county population-wise in the state mm -hmm. of Georgia. Uh, the school systems here, the guidance counselors are fundamentally at Stretched. capacity. Stretched. Their focus is going to be on their juniors and seniors. Mm -hmm. So a freshman walking into their office already <laughs> is going to be like, in. <laughs> cool, mm -hmm. but I've got this stack of students mm -hmm. that are at that point mm -hmm. where they need my help right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then also there's, you know, any guidance counselor is going to kind of have their schools with their specialties, you know, specialists at getting students into. Mm -hmm. And if you have and UGAs a, is the best one in the region because so there's that. in the state of georgia if you mm -hmm. live in the state of georgia and you go to a school that is a state school here in georgia and you maintain a 3.0 the state's going to pay for your college through mm -hmm. the hope scholarship so most students even high achieving academic ones want mm -hmm. to go to a school where they're guaranteed that that school's going to get paid for so georgia tech university of georgia those are kind of you know the top tier things that students are going to be aiming to get into and so guidance counselors here are going to be specialists at doing that. So if you have an ambition of an Ivy League, you know, a Harvard, a Yale, a Columbia, then you have to reach outside of the school system. You have to reach outside of the school system what because I end up. that's not the wheelhouse mm -hmm. of those counselors with the demand that they have. And that's a perfectly reasonable position. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's work for me. It is. So, <laughs> so it, it's mm -hmm. not to disparage Mm -hmm. the opportunities that are available no. to people. But again, traditional school but, however, works however, 70% of people. However, I have a niece who was, who got a 1200 on her SAT and the guidance counselor told her to go to perimeter. Right. Not yet. So kids are being under counseled. They are. I feel like the top 10% of kids are being counseled and the rest are being told to go to perimeter. And in Georgia, Perimeter is the community college. Um, it's one of the, yeah. The but, community college system. Yes. Here. So mm -hmm. another trend that I've noticed, mm -hmm. which is going to feed into the future of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Another trend that I've noticed is historically homeschooling is very book-based. You go and you buy a curriculum and, you know, even back 10, 15 years ago, some stuff was online. Um, so there two, was more stuff online 15 well, years ago than there is now. Two things have happened. Mm -hmm. The things that are online have gone behind paywalls. Mm -hmm. 15 years ago, those resources were newly being developed. They were excellent opportunities mm -hmm. and they were all free. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of them are things that you have to subscribe to, things that you have to enroll in. However, what has shifted in the online landscape something that's new is this responsive learning so that if a student is working on a certain discipline the program can tell how proficient the student is in an area and encourage that student to learn new things while also kind of drilling the the course stuff that they might already know and really pushing and leaning in on things that they don't know so that they can progress to mastery because mm -hmm. I guess that's a, fundament, a fundamental underlying element of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. We don't, you don't take a homeschool child and say, well, I'm going to give you a grade and you're, you've got this one stab at this topic and now that grade is going to be your grade and it's going to follow you forever. No, when you homeschool, your mindset is completely different. Your mindset is to, we're gonna develop a skill. We're teaching toward mastery. Right. And so ultimately we're going to assign a grade to that mastery but it's the purpose is to develop the skill and no matter how many times we have to do something mm -hmm. until that skill is learned then we're just going to keep doing it you don't just turn in an assignment and you know well you've got a 76 on this so that was your grade and now we're moving on to the next thing mm -hmm. so these 
responsive programs and some of it is being fueled by AI. Um, there are several different platforms that encourage this type of learning. And so you can have a student go in and if they're struggling with you know, these functions in Algebra 2, mm -hmm. the program is going to keep giving them that in different ways until the student until figures out how to you know, answer it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a trend in the digital platforms and digital yeah. curriculum. What's cool about that is if they're struggling in it, the program will also know to go back, to back up, and then move forward again. So technology-wise, there are some amazing things happening. Um, now, so leaning into the future of where home mm -hmm. schools going, mm -hmm. you know, I would see that developing and becoming a richer landscape of tools that are available. Well, it's kind of crazy because there's also this trend for everyone, you know, because of isolation, to flock to homeschool programs such as the one that we have. So right. let's bring all our kids to a homeschool program so they can have their tribe and they can have their community. Right? And that's Absolutely. really cool. But also let's keep individualized learning. And so that's where the technology comes in because I imagine math class being a big math lab with computers all the way around the room and four or five tutors walking around. And so that each kid is learning the math that they're at. Right. And what then the need. tutors are saying, oh, you look stuck. Let me help you with that. Whereas I do see also see value in a teacher sitting down and teaching everyone order of operations. Right. So like some, I just- It's blended. The a vision blended I blended. have from homeschooling is so crazy because it, it feels more like a community center right. for learners where there are lectures, um, there's group projects, there's individualized learning, there are para pros, um, parents can come and go, kids can come and go. Um, that That's how, where I see the future of homeschool right. going. And I think when that happens, the acceleration is gonna be nuts. It is. Because acceleration means, you know, Timmy starts homeschooling at nine, um, he's doing good, and Timmy doesn't know that you don't have to like do all this work at the rate that he's doing it because first, second, and third grade school, they were doing a ton of work. So Timmy keeps working at that speed, and we look up and we're like, oh, Timmy needs to be in college. Okay, got it. <laughs> and and I, I, this happened this month. There was a child who, um, it was accelerating and accelerating and accelerating and turned to mom and said, I want to go to public high school. And mom came to me and I'm like, what's their test scores? Mm -hmm. This child belongs in college. Dream of homeschooling. That's my dream for homeschooling. I, that, yeah. That's really common. It's actually. Common. It is. Um, you, like, the students aren't necessarily, that student might be a genius. No, that's sort of genius. <laughs> but, but, but we have another one like that. And our yeah, it's, so the student's not necessarily a genius. When you are learning at an individualized pace, mm -hmm. you're cutting out so much of the filler that mm -hmm. is built into a mass learning experience. Mm -hmm. Even the AI does that. It cuts out the filler because when you take seventh grade math, for instance. Okay, favorite online homeschool program that's still free, thank goodness. Um, you take um, seventh grade math, you, you master it with a 95%, then you go into pre-algebra and you're already at 45%. Because the program's got all of it sharing this information. Whereas yeah. in a textbook, you start with the next textbook and you start over. Our vision of this homeschool community, we're not the only ones doing this. We are not. Homeschool so co-ops, homeschool micro schools homeschool pods these are kind of a thing they were a huge thing 15 years ago it's a resurgence it of kind community. of fell off it became a big thing it, again it, why but, did it fall off but here's the problem it fell off because people started making large big huge homeschool academies right and now we seem to be back around to more of a grassroots movement kind of so you had a very grassroots thing where your co-ops were, you know, Mom and Pop. 10 families. Mm -hmm. And then everybody sort of grouped into these big movements where, you know, it's like, 
a large high school, mm -hmm. we've come back to the small, intimate community kind of things. Mm -hmm. However, to some extent, COVID schooling has upended that landscape again. Because a lot of families, when they pulled out, again, the mind of a COVID schooler, mm -hmm. where do I send my child for school now? And so these families flocked into these small local communities. And some of them expanded. They got physical locations. They hired teachers to accommodate the surge. Well, now that surge is going back to traditional schools. And we put our foots down. Our foot. We, we did. put both of our foots. Both of them. <laughs> we, we, Falling we, down. We put our feet down and said, you can't come in unless you know you're going to homeschool to the end. I solemnly swear I'm going to homeschool to the end. Right. Nope. Also, we, we did not go out and do, because we talked about this. We mm -hmm. talked about hiring staff to accommodate people that were, you know, kind of talking to us. And we did have a couple of families who were like, no, no, we're going to stay. And then they wanted to go back to public school. Parents wanted their lives back. It, it's, <laughs> which is, that's mm -hmm. fine. But we mm -hmm. only had a couple of families, so it didn't hit only us. Only a couple got through because Very we hard. were like, we're not doing this. We're not bending right. for COVID schooling because this looks real cute, but I can foresee right. getting a building and hiring staff to only have to let everyone go in a year or two. But over the last six months, we've watched three very successful co-ops go under. And, and they were successful we, before. They were successful before COVID, COVID school. But then the expansion and then the collapse. And they have had to close their doors. Mm -hmm. And we know of a couple of others that don't have the enrollment numbers that they wanted to have. And they're going to be okay long run. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're in a place where they're struggling right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has shifted the landscape of homeschooling. We just decided that it was extent. better to be small. Right. Um, than to artificially expand. Right. <laughs> I do see this trend of smaller, more connected home group, homeschool groups being a more prolific thing going forward. Yeah, and, and, and part of our bigger dream is not to have a school-sized community center. It's still to keep it at 3,000 square feet with a dozen or so families. And then when we fill to capacity, open another one three or four miles away or 10 miles, ten away. miles away 10 miles away so that each program is a community so one of the current trends in homeschooling and this feeds into the historical trends but then also feeds into the smaller more close-knit communities is there's kind of some undercurrent of division in the way that homeschool communities are formed right now you have people who are homeschooling for religious reasons. Which is and, more traditional. Which is more traditional, and so there's definitely a religious homeschooling element, but you also have this movement of a highly secular homeschool ideology. Mm -hmm. To the extent that if you kind of get into the message boards, like the highly secular things have no even undercurrents of traditionally religious tones or um, allegories, things that may even be part of popular culture kind of get trimmed out for the highly secular. And so this kind of exists on a spectrum. And then somewhere in the middle is what I guess the community is calling neutral. It's mm -hmm. not religious, but it's not necessarily a fully sanitized secular mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you have communities and pods that will often band around one of these ideas, um, whether they're trying to be inclusive, which will usually fall neutral because something that's fully inclusive isn't going to be exclusionary of religious things. And the true secular homeschool model is going to be ex exclusionary of religious things. And I mean, there's some reasons for that. Mm -hmm. And so part of that feeds into these smaller homeschool communities where you can ensure that the families that are there are kind of all on the same page. Mm -hmm. This can be a good thing. This can also be problematic. Shaky. Because while you can create the most comfortable environment for the kids and let the kids be kids mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, manage those interactions and you know, encourage greater learning because you don't have some of that internal, emotional, and 
um, intellectual strife that's happening um, and mental anguish sometimes. You're closely managing that, but then when you have these smaller groups, what can happen is they can fall apart very easily, especially if you have one or two families that are kind of controlling the whole tone of the group. Mm -hmm. If something happens and that family, you know, they have a medical emergency and their kids have to go back to a traditional school because the mm -hmm. parents can no longer homeschool. Right. Um, or there's a falling out between two major families and then mm -hmm. sort of the whole community falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the risks that you run with a smaller community. Well, a small community built around any ideology right. is always going to have some fracture. But what I found for us is that, you know, our goal to be all inclusive led us to be neutral. It did. And so we found that there are some people, like we're not everyone's cup of tea. We are not everyone's cup of tea. Um, but I, what I said is, if neither groups like us, then we must be doing it right. Which is true, because we had, <laughs> we were mm -hmm. aware that the spectrum existed mm -hmm. when we created our organization and our mm -hmm. program, but it wasn't something we cared anything to really focus on. Mm -hmm. Neither ideology really spoke to us. No. Um, we did know that personally, our organization, we didn't want it to be a strictly religious organization mm -hmm. because we wanted there to be a place that was a safe space for homeschoolers who were not religious. Right. Um, and in my this... experience, mm -hmm. I, you know, we, I've always been surrounded by people who homeschooled for religious reasons, which is cool, um, but I know a lot of adult homeschoolers who came up in that environment, and they specifically said to me, hey, do something different, you know. But then, you know, we have also experience, because our goal is to network with as many organizations be they homeschool or not mm -hmm. as we can and we find it difficult for the people who are very seriously secular mm -hmm. they don't necessarily want to interact with other groups that aren't mm -hmm. um, which is fine I understand they're cultivating safe spaces for people who have experienced religious trauma mm -hmm. or and that's an important need or want children to make their own religious decisions at a certain age because there's some of that also there is some of that Mm -hmm. People who are openly exploring tend to be a little more toward the neutral side of that scale. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and not anyone is going to be, you know, nothing is a monolith on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. You have people at extremes at both ends, and then most people kind of fall somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, we personally seek out a fully inclusive environment. Mm -hmm. and try to make this as comfortable and safe a space for anybody as we mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. um, which is work. Which is work. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily what everybody's doing. And so there is an organization out there for anyone. Um, just kind of be aware that undercurrent is part of the trend of homeschooling. So if you're new to homeschooling, maybe decide where on that spectrum you want to be because people might have very strong opinions about that. Mm -hmm. So we love to answer questions, so if you have any, please leave those for us in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, we hope that you will like, maybe subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends. Until next time. Until next time. <laughs>